Let us worship God in the reading of his word as it is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. Beginning at verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, <clears throat> he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not <clears throat> to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? And understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, <clears throat> Who do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? <clears throat> Simon Peter answered <clears throat> and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in, in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. <clears throat> I 
Our text this evening is found in the second book of the Bible, <clears throat> the book of Exodus. We'll be looking together at the last uh, two verses of this chapter, Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of, cl of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Israel was sent down into Egypt, and decades gave way to generations. And there were those born who grew up, had children, and grandchildren, and died. And generations gave way to centuries. People were placed, as you know, into slavery. And they spent 400 years. And as you'll recall, the intensity of that bondage continued to grow until it had reached a feverish pitch. Uh, they had seen the increase of brutality, the increase of humiliation, and thus the increase of despair. And it was out of those depths that in their agony they began to cry out to Jehovah and to cry with a great cry so as to make their throats uh, hoarse uh, with their cry. And we're told in the Bible that a word from heaven was sent unto them through the mouth of Moses. A word of deliverance that they would be brought out of these desperate and deplorable circumstances. Indeed, they were given again the promise of Abraham from the God of Abraham. And they were told that the Lord would bring them out and bring them uh, to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that was lush, uh, a land that was full of bounty, fertility, and of fruitfulness, and that God would give it unto them as their inheritance, assuring them that it was theirs, telling them it is yours and it is all yours. And then they watched as God arose and began to scatter his enemies, and he came with ferocity and sent plagues down upon the head of Egypt. And in due course, as you know, he brought them out with a strong arm. And one can imagine how, for the Israelites, their hopes would have been raised, how their imaginations would have been captivated after all of these years, all that they've known, all that their grandparents had known, all that their great-great-grandparents had known, all that they had lived in the midst of for so long. Now there was expectation. We see them moving, and they're coming out of, of Egypt. And the Lord appears to be taking them out from under uh, the yoke of bondage. And then we come to these words in the verse immediately preceding our text, in verse 20, when it says partway through, and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. So there they were. They're moving, they're coming out, and now they stand on the cusp, they stand on the brink, or as the text says, in the edge of the wilderness. What a contrast that sight would have brought to them, a contrast to all that they had been thinking of with regards to the land of promise. They would have looked out onto this sprawling wilderness. They would have seen undoubtedly uh, the swirling dust. They would have seen craggy rocks. They would have seen miles and miles of sand. They would have seen as far as the eye could see nothing but dryness, nothing but destitution, uh, nothing uh, but what is a wilderness, a howling wilderness. And no doubt they could have said to themselves, what is this? What is this? We know that in the days and weeks and months that followed, that indeed they did ask questions like, what is this? We in this, this wilderness. 
And yet the Lord had instructed them that they had to pass through this wilderness in order uh, to reach their inheritance in the promised land. Now, as you, I trust, know, must know, that all of this uh, typified for them and us spiritual realities. Uh, it is, in many ways, a graphic picture of a Christian parallel where the Lord comes to his people and we are found in bondage and we are found in all sorts of terrible circumstances under the dominion of sin and, uh, and of, of Satan. And the Lord comes with a gospel promise and he says, I'll deliver you from all of this and I'll bring you out from under this. And the Lord's people are enabled by his grace to receive that promise with faith and they are brought out, as it were, in the salvation of their souls and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, the Christian finds themselves so often in parallel circumstances where it's as if they stand on the brink of all of the, the, the hopes of what the Lord has given, and they look out over what appears to be a howling wilderness. And the Christian is tempted, perhaps, to say, Oh, Lord, what is this? There is so much wilderness so much wilderness that we must pass through, however many years or days the Lord has given us. There's so much wilderness that we must pass through before we reach our inheritance, before we're brought to glory, before we're brought in to that heavenly Canaan. And it's that context in which this text that we're considering comes to us a text in which the Lord Jesus Christ is set before us as Christ, our pillar, where we see the provision of his promised presence. As the Christian surveys, as it were, miles of wilderness, tracks of wilderness between us and glory, the Lord gives to us this picture of himself. And so we're going to consider three things from Verses 21 and 22, as we seek by God's grace to meditate upon these words. First of all, we see that our pillar <clears throat> is a guide. First of all, our pillar is a guide. Verse 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. He went before to lead them. So the Lord is serving as a pillar, pillar of cloud, uh, to lead his people. Now, this is really the story of the whole book. And if you go to the very end of Exodus, and I mean the very end, chapter 40 and the last uh, few verses, you see in verse 36, 37 and 38, and when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. And if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. The whole period spent in the wilderness was accompanied by the promised presence of God manifest to them as their Lord, the pillar. Now, no doubt they thought to themselves at the beginning as they looked out, they did not know where to go. I mean, what, what course do we take? I mean, how do we make our way through this? I mean, what, what direction do we follow? How, what's, the, what's the proper course that we should, we should take? And it's much like the Lord's people. We often feel in our Christian pilgrimage, you know, wondering how we know how to navigate all of the waters and, or excuse me, all of the terrain that we have before us all of the hills and valleys and all of the stretches that will have so much varied terrain in our Christian experience. There's so many unexpected afflictions and difficulties and, and surprises, and there's going to be so much we could have never anticipated and we feel entirely unprepared for. We don't know where to go. And yet the Lord comes to his people and he says, I will be your guide from Egypt the, the threshold of Egypt to the very door of Canaan. And I will take you through and in and give you the inheritance. And so when the cloud rose, they moved. And when the cloud rested, 
they stayed put. And they did so week after week, month after month, year after year. Even in the night, they were not left. The, the pillar was also a pillar of fire so that they would never lose their way, so that in the, the bleakness of the darkness of night, they would have the path illuminated before them. And it wasn't just someone scratching down uh, some directions here and there, but it was the Lord himself in the midst of his people. And they were guided. Every step was illuminated uh, before them. My friends, we, we've missed everything if we do not clearly see that this is the Redeemer who's being set forth before us, that this is Christ who has promised to never leave his people, indeed has never left his people, and never forsaken a single one, has never abandoned a single one of his people in all of their earthly pilgrimage, as varied as that can be, and as difficult as that can be, the Lord has seen from the threshold of their conversion until their crossing out of this world, the great divide, into glory. This is Christ. He never, has, he never leaves the Christian to himself. In trouble, in the midst of temptations, in the dark, and how often the Lord's people have found themselves in what feels like inky darkness, never left in all of these. The Lord leads his people, and our psalms are full of this. The way in which we sing praise to him with regards to it. Psalm 27, verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Be our pillar that guides us. Lead us in a plain path, especially, it says, because of mine enemies. Make, O Lord, it a way of plainness for us so that we will be led through all of the, the, the entanglements, the difficulties, the questionings, the hardships, the confusion. Be our guide through it all. And the Lord is. He gives to us his word. His word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And we find ourselves <clears throat> looking away to the Lord, coming to commune with him in his word, and what does he do? He shines. The light is like a torch. It's like a pillar of fire. And it, and it illuminates our path and it makes clear. It helps us to see what it is uh, that the Lord would have us to do, where the Lord would have us to go. This is the way. Walk ye in it. The Lord is our wisdom. And we're told in Matthew, 5, or Matthew 1 verse 5 that when we seek him and we ask him for wisdom, that he withholds none. That indeed he provides from himself, all that is needed, ample wisdom, so that we are those who come asking in faith are with lacking none. Christ is guiding us in his wisdom. And as I say, it's the whole way. It's not merely getting us out the gate and pointing us in the right direction. No, it is the whole way. No doubt you have sung the words of the end of Psalm 48, as I have with um, great uh, appreciation, great affection in the prose version, for this is our, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be, will be, he will be our guide, even unto death. In other words, our pillar, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our guide all the way, every step of the way. Secondly, we see that Christ, our pillar, is also a defense. <clears throat> He's also a defense to his people. Now, again, you can imagine yourself, the Israelites, they're bolting from Egypt. They've gathered all of their belongings, their children, their livestock, they've gathered the loot that they've taken from Egypt, and they're making their way, as it were, out the door. And yet they look out on the edge of this wilderness, and they have in hot pursuit behind them the world power, right? Pharaoh with his apparently invincible army. He's in hot pursuit behind them, and they look out in front of them. They're fleeing, and what is there in the wilderness? There's no shelter there. Right? There's no defense there. 
There, there's, no, there's no fortress there. It's not as if they can all pile through some a heavy gate, heavy walled city and go into a tower and all, you know, lock down and be safe. No, they have nowhere to go. Nowhere to go at all. And you look at how this is described in the next chapter in Exodus 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. Here is the pillar. This is Christ. He is the captain of the host, is putting himself between his people and their ferocious enemies. And he is as a pillar, standing as a defense for them. This pillar was a barrier. It was better than a fortress, better than a wall. It was a shield, a divine shield that was protecting him. And they were hid behind it. And they were safely tucked away. And we're, we're told that it, the pillar cast darkness over Egypt. So the Egyptians are left in the darkness. And simultaneously, that same pillar cast light upon Israel so that they could, could see. And we're told that it was the Lord did so in such a way that Egypt could not find them, could not get to them all the night long. I mean, these details are something, if you had lived through them, would have been, would have been burned into your memory, easy enough for us to pass over but not so easy for Israel. And they did remember these very details. You think of the end of Joshua in Joshua 24 for just one example. It comes out in the Psalms as well. But in Joshua 24, verse 7, And when they cried unto the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Do you remember Israel? The Lord, your pillar, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Our pillar is a shield. How often we sing of this in the Psalms as well, that God singing to the Lord as God our shield. Psalm 28 would be one example. <coughs> in verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is my strength and my shield. God is our shield. When the enemies, when our enemies, real enemies, terrible enemies, ferocious enemies, when enemies are too great for us, it is Christ himself who stands between us and them. And he tucks us, as it were, behind him. He is a darkness to them, and he is a light to his people. And there is so much, the Christian, in this earthly pilgrimage, which is a wilderness. There is so many dangers that threaten us, both from within and from without. We have the danger of the world with all of its enticements. We have the danger of the flesh. We have the danger of the devil himself. I mean, devil, the devil reduces Pharaoh to obscurity and insignificance in contrast. We have these enemies which hate and, and would love to devour and destroy the Lord's people. And yet the Lord says, no, no, not for an instance, not today, not ever. I, Christ the pillar, am a shield to my people, a defense for my people. You remember the words of the prophet when the enemy comes in like a flood? The Lord raises up a standard against him. You remember in the New Testament how the Lord tell, assures us that the devil will be caused to flee from us. That the Lord has destroyed our enemy, has vanquished and has triumphed and has proven himself glorious uh, for his people. And he is putting all things under his feet and ours 
so that as our great king, he subdues his and our enemies. And this is the privilege and the position of the genuine Christian who look away to Christ, our pillar. So secondly, he is our pillar as a defense. Thirdly, our pillar is also a comfort. Our pillar is a comfort, and I'm sure you can see the relevance of how consolation would have been so precious in a place like the wilderness. In verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and by night. In the wilderness, <clears throat> we, we don't know much about darkness, I'm, I'm afraid, in our own day here in the East Coast, here in South Carolina. We don't ever get anywhere that is truly dark, right? There's always some ambient light. We have cities and, you know, there's illuminated dwellings and there's, there's other things and so on. And our sky, you know, is washed out as a result of that in terms of what we, we see. But in the wilderness, there's no ambient light. There was no ambient light at all, right? It was pitch blackness, the kind of darkness that few of us have probably experienced. But you know from your, your own history and your own life how darkness causes, uh, it accentuates the sounds, doesn't it? When you can't see, one sense is limited, the other senses become more acute, and you, you know, the littlest and smallest sounds become apparent to us. And you become very conscious of all that is unknown. You can't see what is around you. And there's so much that is unknown that is around you. And of course, in the wilderness, you had jackals and you had serpents and scorpions and you had all sorts of threats that were, were there. Now you think to yourself when you're in the dark, the comfort that is brought to you from light. If you're sick, you're up at night, you're, it's dark, you feel miserable, whatever. You turn on a light. And it's great, it's very consoling just to have a little bit of light, you know, or if you're uneasy about something, noises that you're hearing and so on, the light, the light scatters the darkness, it's a balm. Well, my friends, what a balm, this enormous, tall pillar of fire and how it would have cast light far and wide, how it would have eliminated the outreaches of what they, they could not see, and it would have provided sight all around their, their dwellings and so on. What a consolation and balm this is. And yet, my friends, it is Christ that is being set before us here. Christ is a light, the New Testament says, to those who sit in darkness, right? He is the light of the world. He is the light of his people. And there is consolation in the presence of Christ, the pillar who is guiding every footstep of his people through their whole life in route to glory. There's the consolation of his presence with us. Well, that fire not only gives light, but as you should know, what else does fire do? Fire also gives heat, doesn't it? And you know from probably your reading or whatever else, I mean, in the desert, you, what happens? The, the temperatures get extraordinarily high. Oh, intense heat in the, in the daytime, you know, beating down upon the sand. But what happens at night? The reverse, right? And the temperatures can fall and they can plummet really enormously. And it can become cold in that, that same place. Well, here they are in the wilderness. And the Lord is a heat to them in the midst of of this cold night, right? This is Christ and the consolation of his people as our pillar who guides us through this earthly pilgrimage. It's interesting to me that both the word of God and the Holy Ghost are spoken of in terms of fire. Is not my word as a fire, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces, Jeremiah says. The Holy Ghost, of course, is also pictured as a fire in the New Testament. And the Lord is pleased to give us himself and to give us these tokens of blessing to keep us uh, warm in the midst of a hostile world, uh, to keep us warm in the midst of our own spiritual coldness, uh, to impart zeal and fervency in our holiness, 
to give to us all that is necessary. His word warms and strengthens. I mean, it's interesting that, that the, the disciples on the road, uh, when they're with the Savior, and he opens the scriptures and begins to show them himself <clears throat> out of the Old Testaments, their response is what? Did not our hearts burn within us? Right? The presence of Christ, the ministry of Christ in his word, it is casting heat and it is penetrating the depths of their soul. And they say, did not our hearts burn within us? Well, it's a pillar of cloud, we're told in the text, by day. Now, this is equally a consolation. <coughs> you can picture it. <coughs> this giant pillar of cloud. Because where are they? They're in the wilderness. What are they exposed to in the daytime? They're exposed to the scorching heat of a very hot sun. Now, what happens? We've had heat here in South Carolina. If you've had to spend time outside uh, working in the yard or something else, you know immediately what this is. I mean, it's 90-something degrees. It's humidity. The sun is beating down. You're feeling it, sapping your strength, soaking the moisture, drying the moisture up out of you, you know, depleting all of your energy and so on and clouds pass over. What happens? It's like immediately you're, the relief that you feel and the gratitude, the consolation that you feel. Well, these were spending years in this wilderness. They end up spending years in the wilderness. And the Lord is to them a pillar of a cloud. He's casting shade over them. You think of all of the ways that this comes out in the in the prophets, in the Song of Songs, in the Book of Psalms, and so on, where in various ways it tells us that we as the Lord's people sit down under the shade of the Almighty. We sit down under the shade of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a rich blessing, a consolation to us. The Lord is providing shade to us in our earthly pilgrimage. It comes out again in Psalm 121, and maybe the, these words will stand out more to you now in this, this psalm, which is really a psalm about pilgrimage, isn't it? It's about the Lord keeping us body and soul throughout our whole pilgrimage. Well, in those very brief words where the, the Lord is to, set forth, Christ is set forth in Psalm 121 as Christ our keeper in, in merely eight verses. But in verse five, this is included. The Lord is thy shade. The Lord is thy shade. It conjures up the picture of the pillar of a cloud. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Christ, our pillar, is also a great comfort to his people. My friends, we have a Savior. We have a Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who passed through this wilderness himself. In his humiliation, the Lord Jesus Christ tread the whole path, the whole road. He passed through this wilderness, yea, even through the door of death, as the forerunner of his people. He first into glory, as it were, on behalf of his people, at least in, in that sense. What a comfort it is to then have him as the one who would be our guide and our defense and our comfort all the way through our own pilgrimage. He is almighty, he is all wise, he is all tender, and he is altogether promised to be with us. He took not away the pillar. Those are great words. At the beginning of verse 22, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Christ is, dear beloved Christian, your pillar. Now for those outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, everything that we have said can be said in antithesis. Everything that we've said, the unbeliever is without. To not have Christ as our pillar 
is to be without a guide, is to be without a defense, and is to be bereft of any consolation. It alerts us to how desperate our need is, oh, to go through the scorching wilderness of this world only to enter into something that cannot even be compared to the scorching lostness of a never-dying eternity separated from Christ the pillar and from his favorable presence forever and ever. My friends, we desperately need to run to him. He set forth, he says, I am a pillar. I am all of these things for those who run under my shade, for those who come unto me, who, those who are looking away, <clears throat> who rather than perishing in the city of destruction, remaining as it were in the bondage of sin, have set before them the gospel promise and all of its beauty, where the Lord says, I am a deliverer, I can and I will deliver to the uttermost. And he offers that gospel to us in all of its freeness and all of its fullness. And he says, take it, have it, believe it, receive it, and come unto me. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Come unto me, and I will be your pillar all through this, this earthly world and bring you safely to the other side, to the, the promised inheritance, the eternal inheritance of being forever with the Lord in glory. Do you see how precious this is, Christ our pillar, against the backdrop of the prospects of a howling wilderness? Tracks and tracks, miles and miles of it. Against that backdrop, we are met with the promise, the promise that the Lord Jesus Christ will be our guide and defense and consolation, and that he, our pillar, will never and can never be taken away. Let's stand for prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we come confessing that you are a good, a great, a glorious, and a gracious God. We are thankful for your Son and the Savior of your people, for giving unto us the Lord Jesus Christ. How grateful we are for a guide and a defense and a consolation in this world that we are left with his presence and he will be our guide even unto death. Lord, grant that our hearts would go out with fresh faith and fresh love and that we, O Lord, might delight in him and that we might find our souls refreshed and strengthened in him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing from Psalm 78, verses 12 to 17. The tune is Manchester, which is number 84. Verse 12, things marvelous he brought to pass. But then go down to verse 14 to see one of those marvelous things that we've been thinking about here. In verse 14, with cloud by day, with light of fire all night, he did them guide. We'll sing verses 12 to 17.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.